I remember that Sunday, um, I only had enough, like there was this fried chicken place next to me that had this deal on sandwiches and I only had enough for like five sandwiches. So I just bought all five oh, gosh. and I'm going to ration this throughout the week. And, and that was, it basically took me to, I think like $11 in my bank or something super low. Um, and the first day at work, they took me out to lunch and I was like, thank God. Like I think Hey everyone, Jessica here. Really excited for today. Uh, today we have Isan here. He's um, an incredible fintech product person. Um, Isan, welcome to our YouTube channel. Thank you for having me, Jessica. I'm honored to be here. So by way of background, maybe before jumping into it, Isan and I have known each other uh, for, for a while now. Uh, we work together at Earnin, um, building products, you know, bringing fairness into the financial system, helping tons of people get access to wages early uh, without, you know, crazy fees. So I thought it would be super fascinating to have you on our channel because, you know, you've been in and around fintech, uh, making an impact for customers from the product building side for a while. Um, and it would be really great to hear about your career, um, both in terms of product, in terms of fintech, um, and also what's, uh, you know, the, the key to what we're trying to do here is to hear your approach to personal finances um, and, and just in general, hear your story. Let's do it. Cool. Awesome. Um, maybe to get started, uh, it'd be great. Could you tell us a bit about yourself? Um, I think you graduated from Cornell. Tell us a bit about uh, your experience, maybe sort of post-graduation, uh, what you majored in and sort of what you've been up to since then. Yeah. So... Uh, I guess I'll start in, in the middle of college. Um, and when I went to school, and I don't want to date myself too much, but when I went to school, um, especially on the East Coast, like finance and consulting were definitely the big industries for people to go into. Um, and I, I was a physics major. Um, I double majored in physics and economics. And, and physics is also, it's cool, but it's not very applicable to the real world. Um, and I think I was like the only kid in my program. There might've been one or two of us out of 50 that didn't go get a PhD. And like, I, I knew I never wanted to do that. I just kind of love physics and was into it that way. Um, but I was left in a situation kind of at the end of like my sophomore year where I was like, okay, what should I do after graduation? I should probably intern somewhere. This investment banking thing seems a little too, um, like it seems like the intensity to interesting ratio was a little off from what I was looking for. Um, consulting was similar. So honestly, I very serendipitously uh, just ended up working at this one startup and, and loved it. Um, so I was like, okay, I think there's something nice about on the earlier side of tech companies when there's just a ton of shared camaraderie, like you're all around a table, you're all kind of slogging together. You know, anyone's win is the company's win. Anyone's loss is a company's loss. Like I really liked that. And then I ended up like rejoining one that I'd interned with because they successfully raised some money. Um, and yeah, so I think, again, very serendipitous because they, I think, were on the fence about like, you know, if they had enough capital to bring me back or not, but, but they did. Um, and yeah, I think just generally college career, life career, everything's been very serendipitous and, and, and luck driven. That's probably the best way to describe it. Um, I joined as employee number seven. I, can't, I think my title was associate. So like, I don't really know what that meant. They just, right. We all just kind of filled in the gaps where we needed to. Um, but yeah, that first job was actually pretty horrible. Um, I, I really did not like it. Um, and uh, I, I was very like naive and, and immature in my youth. And so I, I kind of rage quit one day <laughs> after being fed up with it. Wait, after um, in, this is after interning, after like thinking, hey, this is this is going well. And then it, it didn't work out. I think the biggest difference, and I, I've learned this over the course of my career, my manager when I was an intern wasn't my manager, or he had left the company by the time I joined, and I had a different manager. And it was, I mean, it, sh she did this thing that really graded on me where she would take credit for all the work I did. Oh. And then my CEO would be like, hey, Asan, you need to work harder. Look at X. She's done all of this. And I was like, wait, like 70% of that is mine. But they would never, it was like a he says versus she said, and she would never back. And so- 
I was kind of fed up with that. It was like this negative feedback loop of they thought I wasn't doing anything and I wasn't getting credit. And then it was just like, I was like, all right, I'm done. Um, and then, um, and then, yeah, I think after that, again, like went and, and did BD at this other SaaS company, mostly because, um, uh, again, this is like naivete of my youth. The founder was from Bangladesh. I'm from Bangladesh. I was like, oh, cool. Like there's some connection. Let me go work for him. Um, and then, you know, realized BD wasn't, wasn't really the right fit. Uh, and then I joined another company again, very serendipitously, um, that was started by someone I knew personally. And then he also very serendipitously, there's so much luck in all of this, but he was like, look, like I'm going to make your title product manager because that'll be good for your long-term career. And I was like, I don't know what that means, <laughs> but I'll take it. Um, and that's kind of how I like fell into product. Uh, I'd say that, that company, um, we, we had raised a little seed round and then uh, basically didn't find product market fit and had to shut down really before we launched. And then that was a fintech company. And then after that, I pivoted to work at Quovo, which was another fintech company as a product manager, was there for a bit and then found Ernan, found you, Jessica, and then joined you at Ernan. Um, and then, you know, moving on to, to Cash App at Square Next. Um, that's the like resume list, but I think hopefully my little anecdotes show that it's like very, it, it was very much like the universe was just doing with me what it wanted to do, despite like what I thought was happening at the time. But because I'm very grateful and privileged that it kind of worked out this way. Um, but yeah. Gotcha. No, super interesting. I, there's like so much there. Uh, <laughs> maybe I could ask like um, that one internship how did you land? How did you stumble upon that one in the first place? Yeah. So I'd say junior summer and senior year were pretty similar, but junior summer, I went on AngelList and I messaged a bunch of places. This company, I think I just really clicked with like that manager who was my manager that summer. Um, and he seemed, he just, he, he seemed very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like less concerned about his brand and more about like just doing good work. And I feel like in tech, that's just a rarity as time goes on. Um, and there's something about that that I appreciate it. So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll come join you. Uh, and in hindsight, I wish I like talked to him a bit more about like why he left and everything. Cause I think uh, some of the same cultural patterns had emerged. Um, but yeah, it was, it was honestly brute, like almost all my internships in college and jobs were just brute force. Like freshman summer, um, I entered at an investment bank and I had to email, I think like a hundred just cold email and, um, and it was a small one in Chicago, sophomore summer, I applied to like, I think like, you know, a bunch of places as well on our career portal ended up at a startup. So for me, it was very, very brute force. I had no network, um, in the U S I, I went to high school in Bangladesh. So kind of had like no connections that I knew I didn't want to do find like banking or consulting, especially cause I'd done like a little mini internship freshman summer in it. Um, so yeah, it was just like trying to put my head down work and not letting like all the rejections just get to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's interesting. You, you've said like when you were initially telling the story, you kept saying like, it's all serendipitous and stuff, oh, but yeah. there's, there's a forced serendipity to it. It sounds like. Um, so, uh, but you, it sounds like, so you did like three startups before Quovo earn in and now cash out like, like you stick, you stuck with it. You stuck with tech throughout this entire sort of journey. Like why? Uh, I think it, it goes back to, so one thing that drew me was the shared camaraderie. I think another was the like tangible impact. I, I remember during one of my summers, I think it was my junior summer, um, Uber had just come out and uh, one of my friends opened it and he was like, how cool would it be if you worked at Uber and then you saw someone on the street, like hail an Uber app on your phone. And, and for me, that framing was just so powerful because I think when people worked in these services industries, like banking and consulting, your feedback loop is, you know, some section of the wall street journal, which right. would be right. cool, but like that wasn't as motivating for you. But I think for me, it was um, like whatever work I put in, it actually manifesting in something physical and tangible that I could somewhat point to um, is really what kind of drew me towards it. And, and then I think as time went on, the kind of promise of tech affecting changes on society only grew. And so there's a lot more kind of discourse around that. And I really wanted to see that realized more and more. 
Um, so that's mostly why I stuck with it. Um, and then I think there's also, again, the, a little bit of that intensity to interest dynamic where I think the incentives or, or the motivations uh, of what I observe, and this is just like my, you know, musings on my couch in New York. So it's not anything scientific, but um, people who I saw worked at tech companies generally to some degree believe in the company they worked for versus people who worked a bit more in the services industries were mostly in it for the money and the prestige. And um, I think this will be like another recurring thing, but I've just never been that motivated by money. I think prestige coming from Cornell and stuff, it definitely like is appealing at times, but I, I, I've tried to like decouple that as much as I can from my decision-making. So I just thought it'd be a bit more fulfilling to work at something that I actually believed in day in, day out, instead of just work for, you know, more money, more prestige, et cetera. Gotcha. Um, no, that's really cool. Um, on product, it, it definitely sounded like you kind of like <laughs> fell into it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now that you, you know, you, you, you've, you've fallen into it, you've been in it for some time. Like, how yeah. would you, how would you recommend other people getting into it? Like that's, you know, like putting yourself in a place where somebody is going to point to you and say, Hey, become a product person. Um, or I'm going to change your title. Uh, it doesn't sound like the the most available. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's like the number one question I get, um, from, from like people in college and stuff. I mean, I guess there's, there's like two somewhat, uh, well-defined paths to product management. And then maybe a third, um, that's like somewhat serendipitous, but maybe forced serendipitous to use your terminology. So the two well-defined ones, I think the most common is out of college or some like associate product manager rotational programs um, that some of the bigger companies put out, but there's so few spots and they're so competitive that that's almost like a needle in a haystack. I think the other one is uh, out of business school, there's a lot of people that go into product management now. And I think I read somewhere that out of like Stanford, um, like the, the number one employer out of Stanford's business school was like Amazon for PM or something like that. Um, and so I think that's like fairly common across business schools. I think Amazon especially only hires like MBA PMs or tries to skew that way. So I think a lot of like MBAs or, and there's other master's programs as well, um, like human computer interaction or et cetera that feed a lot into product management. So grad degrees. Uh, but again, that's, you know, fairly cost prohibitive because MBAs are super expensive and not everyone has a privilege to afford that. Um, I think the third is like the, the fourth serendipity, but I'd say it's more lateraling within a company. So if you join a tech company um, and you, know, you like kind of do well enough there and you can start kind of taking on more responsibilities that are product related, getting closer to the product team and to the uh, product managers, um, managers and so on, then you can try to make a case for moving over. And in the general gist of what I've seen at, at tech companies is if you're a good employee, they'll want to keep you, even if it's not in the same role that you're in. Um, so I'd say in that way, um, you know, it's a little bit of that for serendipity where you do the hard work you put in, um, you try to do a good job and then build those connections and then just raise your hand later. And um, I'd say the the best PM that I've had on that I've quote unquote hired or managed in my career was someone who lateral that I pulled in. Um, so yeah. 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 No, I think that's like that last one is definitely a great, at least what I've seen too, that's a great path because like, it's not just for getting into product. It's for getting into like anything Yeah. for me. Yeah. Uh, I like, I wanted to move into international expansion, prove yourself in another area. And then, then mm-hmm. that opportunity, you know, sort of opens up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I guess that that's somewhat what happened to me ish. It was just that I think like, I, I didn't raise my hand as much versus this person really looked out for me. And I think saw a little ahead of the curve that like product management was going to be, be pretty big later. Um, but yeah. Yeah, maybe we can switch gears a little bit and talk about fintech. Um, fintech just, it's super hot these days. Um, yeah. I, I was like just reading that uh, that in this first six months of 2021, something like $54 billion in VC mm-hmm. money has gone into fintech. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's definitely um, an area of a lot of interest. So curious to know, you know, like you've been working in it. What do you, do you think it's justified? Do you, do you think that there's a lot more to be building in fintech? What are your thoughts overall? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say there's definitely more to be built. I don't know if the capital allocation is necessarily mapping over to that. Like I'd say, I'm generally a little bit more uh, bearish on like neobanks and a lot of those kind of fintech companies right now. Um, I think there's a ton of opportunity on the B2B side. 
um, and it's generally been fairly underserved. Um, and I think we're, we're seeing that with, um, with some other companies that are emerging um, like over the last kind of 18 months or so. Um, so I, I'd say at the highest level, I think there's still a ton of opportunity in FinTech. I'd probably skew a bit more looking at B2B instead of B2C. Um, and then I think there's also still some kind of, uh, I'd say like sentimental part of me that just wants a fintech to surpass like and be one of the top five banks mm. and just like try to take down some of the banks. Like I think I have a, a deep seated dislike, a very strong dislike of a lot of them as institutions. And, and uh, it's a little surprising to me that um, there's so much money being put into fintech without that having happened yet. Like, I think a lot of money is being put on the promise of it happening, but there hasn't right. necessarily been the vindication, which right. I think is a little, um, a little backwards. Well, why do you, model. why do you yeah. think that's the case? Like, why hasn't, uh, you know, one of these fintechs already, you know, unseated one of the top five, or why mm -hmm. don't you think on the other side of it, if, if none of them have, like, if none, none of the existing fintechs have so far, why not believe in the possibility of a neobank? like the gazillion that are that are out there these days yeah. to make it yeah i think well i'd say none have yet i think because at least having worked in it on the consumer side i feel like what what's happened over time is regulation exists um to kind of it's banks have almost set up regulatory moats so that there's direct consumer fintech is so heavily regulated and the bank set it up so that the lines are drawn just around what they do. So like the room for innovation is fairly narrow. And I think that catches a lot of people off guard. I mean, I think the, I think if I, and so I think that's like one of the bigger challenges that's happened, just scaling. Um, I also think if you look at what all these big banks do, they have so many different kind of SKUs and product offerings versus a lot of these neo banks basically start with one thing. So I feel like it's it's a tough problem to solve. So you have to make right. both the economics work, and you right. have to kind of scale like a tech company. So um, I, I think I think so. Maybe a short answer is just really hard because <laughs> of all the considerations, and um, you know, like I, I haven't done it yet. So I, you know, it's easy for me to criticize all these companies, but it's like, who am I to talk? Cool, cool. Um, uh, it would be great to hear about your personal finance journey um, in the time that we have left. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah would, would love to hear about. You know, we heard about sort of like the career um, progression, but like, how did, how did your personal finances sort of all evolve um, uh, along that, you know, journey as well? And maybe even like, how did you sort of get started um, in, in the early days? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think any conversation on personal finance that I have, I just want to disclose, I am like very privileged, like my parents, you know, are like fairly well off. So I think my relationship with personal finance is going to be very different than, you know, the vast majority of people that way. Uh, I think the, the most pivotal moment for me though, was, um, so I, I mentioned that I kind of like rage quit that first job in a moment of naivety. I had some savings, but I didn't really have a strong grasp on like budgeting and savings, but I was like, oh, I have enough in the bank and I have this credit card so I can probably get by. And I, I still remember I was, um, interviewing and I was being like fairly picky. Like I turned down a couple offers I mean, the, the money was like dwindling lower and lower. And I think once it dropped below like 200, oh. it was when I was like, okay, I should like pay a little bit more attention to this. And there was two moments that or three, three stories that really stood out. One was um, I wanted to meet a friend who uh, suggested McDonald's and I went and McDonald's was expensive. It was like a $13 meal. And I'm just like, what? Like I'm getting dollar slice in New York and and I was just like, okay, wow, I need to be really mindful because like <laughs> McDonald's is kind of out of the price range now. Um, and then I remember, uh, when I got, I got this job offer with the, the Bangladesh company that I really liked. Um, and at that point I was like very low. And so they were like, okay, you can start in three weeks. And they offered me the job on a Thursday. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, actually I can start this coming Monday. Cause I knew that the payday <laughs> yeah. would be on Friday. Yeah. So I was like optimizing for that. And I remember that Sunday, um, I only had enough, like there was this fried chicken place next to me that had this deal on sandwiches and I only had enough for like five sandwiches. So I just bought all five oh gosh. I'm going to ration this throughout the week. And, and that was, it basically took me to, I think like $11 in my bank account or something super low. Um, and the first day at work, they took me out to lunch and I was like, thank God, like I can extend <laughs> this out another, another week. But, and so I think my relationship, my personal finances totally changed after that. Cause I had to like, 
really figure it out. But again, I, I was very privileged. I knew that even if my bank dropped to zero, I, I was kind of stubborn. So I was like, I'm not going to ask my parents for help, but they could always help out. And, you know, I would always have a home and shelter and stuff like that. Um, but then part of me was like, look, like I've been so close to the edge and like, you know, like the universe has treated me very well. So I'm not going to stress too much about it anymore. Also, because I know I've been through that, so I can go through it again. And, you know, having gone through it once, it's not as scary. Um, so I think that really influences my relationship with it, where I'm, I'm just not as, I'm not, I'm not optimizing one way or another. I'm not hedging against like being broke and always afraid of it. Cause I'm like, okay, yeah, I've been there. And the worst is, you know, you just eat a lot of dollar slices and you, you know, like get a little unhealthy, but whatever you right. get by. But I'm also not optimizing for like, um, you know, saving and arbitraging every single way I can. I think there's people who are always like, how can I get more money and how can I make the most out of what I have? And kind of like, even when I was broke, I still had a great group of friends. I still have my family. I was still like kind of stressed, but I think because I was privileged and had that safety net, I was decently happy. Um, and then after some point in time, my lifestyle just does not change independent of how much money I make. So I'm like, you know, what, what difference is it really going to do if, you know, I can save like a little bit here on taxes by arbitraging, or I can save a little bit here if I like move this into a Roth, blah, blah, blah. I'm just like, eh, you know, like it'll all work itself out. And my life is like, you know, pretty, like I'm very fortunate anyway. So yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Um, and yeah, maybe you could like, so fast forward today, it sounds like, you know, since, since then it's been yeah. Uh, a lot, a little bit smoother, um, yes, at yes, least from, yes. from a money perspective. Yeah. What is yeah. your, um, what does your money stack look like now? And maybe even a little bit about investments. Like how do you allocate between, uh, sort of various asset classes and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. So I'd say, um, the money I'd say, well, I try to set a rule for myself. Like it, it, Islamically I'm required to give away 5% of my net worth every year. So I, I try to stretch that where I'm like, base would be seven and a half percent, but my target's always 10. So I can give away 10% of my net worth every year. I'd be pretty happy. So I think because of that, I always have like a little more cash on hand. Um, but generally I think it's like probably have about 25% of my net worth in cash. And then maybe like 60 in, um, in like the public markets. Um, and then the remainder is either in like private companies or, um, uh, at this point, I have some in crypto, but that's not something I really recommend. <laughs> oh, really? Um, why, why not? Um, mostly because I, I put it in, or sorry, I wouldn't recommend doing what I did. I put it in only based on hype. <laughs> like I didn't do my own research on any of it. Um, and then it's just been sitting there for a while. So gotcha. yeah. Gotcha. Um, private company investments, like how did you get into that? And uh, sort of how do you mm -hmm. figure out what to invest in, um, that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, oh, and I, I say the last bit that also makes my personal finances way easier is I, uh, I do have like property in my name that was like a hand me down from grandparents. So I think that as a safety net and security net and all that also totally changes the equation for me. Um, and then I, I'm sure there's like other stuff that's in my name that I just haven't done as good job keeping track of. But oh, that's like, right. I think like being privileged and having that safety net, I think totally changes how I approach this stuff. Um, on the private company side, I think it's kind of fun. <laughs> That's really what got me into it. It's, um, you know, I think it, it's almost always people I have some type of like personal relationship with ish, like I met or I really got along with, um, or I think what they're doing is like super cool and we can get excited about it together. Um, and then it's like, okay, yeah, like I, I kind of want to help you. I kind of want to see where this goes. Like, let me get some skin in the game too. Um, but it's, it's, it's like a strange hobby in a way where, um, and I say strange because it's like, I pay because I invest and then I give my time. Right. So like I pay for like my free right. services. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I just have some fun doing it. So I think that's really what, what got me into it. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, hopefully it, hopefully it returns something too. It's not just, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think, um, I, I think that's like the relationship part of it. I, I hope I'm like de-risked enough there where it's like, if there are people I trust and if there's people who I think are thinking about it in like a way that I really like admire or like really think I, like they're like, oh, like, oh yeah, they're super smart and they're really going to do a good job. Then I think that's the best I can do, especially at like the stage I invest in, which is basically when 
a lot of them don't even have like a working product. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's really just for the fun of it. <laughs> um, cool. yeah. Yeah. Um, and do you, so are all of these like one-off, like, are you, um, so just writing single angel text, do you also use like other platforms, like the crowdsourcing type of platforms? Cause I think a lot of people would like to get into angel investing, but, uh, you know, there's that big barrier, the hurdle of like accredited investor. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. sometimes it's even difficult to sort of get into deals, even if you are, you know, accredited or to even find out about deals. And, and I think that exists for good reason though, because I, I think the accredited investor criteria from my understanding exists to protect the investor from losing too much of their net worth. Right. Um, and, and I think if you just look at it statistically, like most companies are going to fail and you're going to lose that money. And then I think there's a very small category of companies that are going to make money. And I think unless you're someone who's like in that space or knows them really well or knows someone who can do it for you, like I would just really advise people not to do it. Um, Cause I, I mean, I worked at one of those equity crowdfunding platforms and you're, you're basically just looking, you're, you're sifting through all the companies that all the like top tier VCs and angels have passed on. Mm. And so the odds are that those companies are probably not going to like turn into anything that good. Gotcha. And so I think the best way to get into it is just if you, if you can find people in tech or um, find people who are trying to build tech companies in an area you have expertise in, I, that was my angle was like, I know FinTech decently well. So everyone's like that I invest in again, it's that weird strangeness where I pay to give people my free services, but my pitch is like, if you let me invest, then I know this kind of well, so I can, you know, I'll spend a couple hours with you here and there. Um, so that's really, that's really how I got in. But I, I, I'd say unless you're like close to people who are going to be founders or people in tech or starting things in your space, I would say not to, I, I would advise against going on the equity crowdfunding places. Cool. Cool. Um, mm -hmm. Any big, any big mistakes, regrets on this? So many. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. On, well, on, on career, on personal finance, both. Oh, or... career, personal finance, basically things you wish you had known earlier um, on, on both fronts. Oh man. I mean, I, I would say, I, I don't know, actually, I don't, I, I wouldn't necessarily say there's things I wish I'd known earlier because I'm very grateful to be where I am now. And I think that's a consequence of me not knowing what I knew and going through my like, you know, really crazy journey of life and career. Um, but yeah, there's so many things that um, I learned over time. I, I'd say the biggest thing um, that I, I wish I'd, I wish I felt a bit more secure in my lack of interest in like just accumulating more money and prestige. Cause I think that was like fairly true to who I am as a person, but going to Cornell and like being in New York, like that kind of going against the grain. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm like perfectly secure with it where I'm just like, all right, like I really don't, really don't care about a lot of these things. Um, so I wish I'd like had a little bit of that security earlier, mostly for like my own mental and emotional health more than anything. What would you, I'm really curious about like not caring about prestige and, and this and money and this kind of stuff. Like what would you do differently or what would you have done differently? What would, what does that look like? Um, how, how would I have acted differently? I mean, I do think a lot of like how I carried myself as a person was just like a real, um, manifestation of like insecurity. Um, and so I, I, I think, I always felt like I had to prove myself in some ways because I wasn't working at like Goldman. Yeah. Um, and then I think after college, uh, I would say it didn't, I think it affected how I carried myself in a different way. Like in college, I was a lot, I think louder and more expressive to like compensate. But I think after college, I would like shrink into myself a lot if I just didn't feel like I uh, deserved to be in like the room with those people. And I think giving myself that validation would have been nice. So I'd say like, that's the other sentiment, but again, I'll caveat that like my lack of like attraction to prestige is based on, you know, like I'm still decently privileged and there's plenty of people I know who literally came from way less than me. And I can totally understand why their relationship with money and all of this is so different than me. Um, so I like sympathize heavily with that. I think this is just my unique like personal story, but yeah. 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 But I, I think what you're saying or resonates a lot with me and resonates, I'm sure a lot with other people in the sense that like, it's almost for mental health in yeah. a way to like, yeah. like not have to compare yourself constantly. Yeah. With others. yeah. 
Um, well, really appreciate you taking the time and uh, yeah. being on this channel. Um, well, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. And that's it. Thank you so much to Hassan for coming on this channel, for being incredibly candid. Um, really enjoyed that conversation. Hope you guys did too. If there are other profiles of people you like to see on this channel, uh, maybe different careers or different personal finance situations, um, please leave us a comment below. Would um, definitely be happy to, to try to find um, people and, and, and bring them on. Um, other than that, if you got value out of this video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more optimizations. Thanks.